that um, the Mass uh, State Legislature has passed with help from, uh, great help from him and, and Margaret Bronte. And the format is gonna be a 20 minute um, explanation by Bruce of a lot of complicated matters and hopefully some simple terms that we can understand. And then Valerie Nelson of the Cape Ann Coalition is gonna ask a question and I'm going to ask a question, five minutes each. And then we're gonna be uh, looking at the chat to answer questions and put them together to get some of the most frequent questions. So as we go through this, please use the chat to put any questions you may have for the final 20 minutes <clears throat> and we'll end promptly at five. Thank you very much for attending. Um, we we'll look forward to this explanation. So Senator Tarr, take it away. <laughs> Well, thank, thank you very much, Dick, and thank you to everyone on the coalition. And it's great to see such a large group of people uh, tuning in for this. And I'm gonna try to make this as painless as possible, but in looking out, I also know that there are a great number of people who have a lot of expertise in this area. And so uh, I certainly uh, will offer my thoughts and comments, but uh, I think there's a lot of expertise on the line to be benefited from as well. And I think that's one of the benefits uh, of this coalition. So I appreciate the opportunity uh, to talk about what's going on. And I wanna talk about it in terms of the evolution of uh, climate policy in Massachusetts. And there certainly has been a lot of it. And I wanna go back originally to 2008, uh, when we passed the Global Warming Solutions Act, which really set the stage for the other steps that have been happening. And the Global Warming Solutions Act was the first piece of legislation that proposed what at the time were thought to be very ambitious goals relative to uh, reducing carbon emissions uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And those goals have since been even further modified. Uh, but again, back in uh, 2008, uh, the goal was to have uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, with a set of reductions uh, that would be achieved by 2020 and a plan for achieving that and ultimately trying to get to at least 80% of reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And as we'll discuss, that goal has been modified, uh, whereas now our goal is to be uh, at zero uh, carbon emissions versus our 1990 benchmark uh, by 2050. Now, what's important about that is since the, Green, uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, which I was also a part of helping to put together was originally passed, the courts have ruled that those emission standards, those reduction requirements are legally enforceable. And that has definitely changed the complexion of the discussion so that now we understand that these are not merely guidelines. Uh, these are enforceable, uh, not goals. These are enforceable requirements uh, that we have to meet. And again, they've been changed largely as a result of the understanding that they now carry the weight of something that, that is legally enforceable, and they've actually gotten to be more aggressive. And that leads us to uh, what happened uh, back in, in 2021 in the first part of the current legislative session, uh, when we adopted legislation known as an act creating a next generation roadmap for Massachusetts climate policy. And again, I apologize because there are a lot of sections to these bills, but I'm gonna try to touch on what I think are some of the highlights and elements of the bills that help inform our greater understanding of, of the whole picture. So one of the things that was important about the bill that passed in 2021 is it did affect those reduction requirements for greenhouse gas emissions that were originally set forth in the Global Warming Solutions Act in uh, 2008. And so to wit, uh, one of the important sections requires the Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs to set that zero emission limit by 2050, and that absolute em emissions in 2050 are not higher than 85% of 1990 levels. So that's a very significant change from where we were originally with the Global Warming Solutions Act. This puts us on a track to have to achieve much more rigid uh, requirements. And in order to get there, another important part of the what I'll call the roadmap bill uh, was to set interim limits. 
And those are things that many of us have been looking for for some period of time so that we didn't wait until some of the larger years came and didn't have any understanding if we were coming close to where we needed to be. So the interim limits allow us to understand how much progress we're making and how many adjustments we need to make uh, to get to some of the larger reductions uh, in some of the, the more significant benchmark years. And so the roadmap bill required interim uh, statewide greenhouse gas emissions limits for 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2045. And not only do those limits have to be set forth uh, by the Secretariat of Energy and Environmental Affairs, but they have to be accompanied with a plan on how we're gonna get there. So we go from 2008 saying, the policy of the Commonwealth is gonna be very dramatic greenhouse gas emission reductions to then having those goals be codified and be legally enforceable to then in 2021, having interim goals that need to be not only put set forth by the secretariat, but also accompanied by a plan uh, for how we're gonna get there. And the roadmap bill even went deeper than that. And so it required the interim 2030 statewide greenhouse gas emissions to be not less than 50% below the 1990 emissions and the interim 2040 statewide greenhouse gas emissions limit to be not less than 75% below the 1990 emissions level. So again, you see that there's a growing degree of specificity, starting with the larger goal, moving to the interim requirements. The interim requirements require a plan. And then beyond that, uh, a couple of these goals, the 2030 and the 2040, have very, very significant requirements for the reduction of greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And one of the things that's important, and I'm not gonna get too much into the, the 2021 bill, uh, but it also requires a written statement uh, by the Secretary of Environmental Affairs, uh, not more than 18 months after the last day of those interim benchmark dates uh, by the Secretary of Environmental Affairs to indicate how we've done in terms of compliance. So the requirements are increasing and the compliance uh, insurance is also increasing and becoming uh, much more significant. Another thing that happened in the 2021 bill, and this is probably the last thing uh, that I'll touch on here, but we see the growing role of the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. And one of the things that the 2021 bill did was require uh, at least $12 million to be uh, sent to the Clean Energy Center to develop our workforce. So one of the things that the legislature has been keenly aware of is that reducing our greenhouse gas emissions is not only critically important environmentally for a whole host of reasons, but it also creates an economic opportunity. And in Massachusetts, we have seen significant job growth, particularly in the solar sector, although the, the pandemic and some of the issues around that caused some of those gains to be lost. But we have seen significant job growth in the solar sector, but uh, we definitely wanna grow those jobs in other places as well. And I think we're all aware of the discussion that's been happening relative to the opportunities with offshore wind and particularly the opportunities with coastal communities. So we know that, for instance, in Salem, uh, there is the major redevelopment of a parcel as a staging area for offshore wind. And we believe that there's the opportunity for the development of that parcel to also create an opportunity for us here in Gloucester, if we can identify the appropriate uh, structural resources uh, on our working waterfront, to be able to have some benefit from that. So that's a little bit about where the roadmap bill took us. It really moved us forward with the interim goals, the compliance mechanisms, and it touched on workforce development. Now, the most recent bill that we passed, uh, very close to the end of the legislative session, uh, that uh, the formal legislative session that we just completed for 2022, is a very broad bill that touches on a lot of different areas. And so I'll, I'll try to be as succinct as I can, but I, I want you to bear with me because there were over 90 sections to that bill. And I've picked out some of the sections that I think are the most important to talk about. But basically the way that I think we need to think about 
that bill, the most recent bill, which we refer to as driving offshore wind forward, was really to try to look at some of the vulnerabilities that we have in reaching the goals that we set out originally in the Global Warming Solutions Act and then in the roadmap bill in terms of our interim goals. And so I'm gonna just touch on, on some of these, but uh, one section of that bill uh, directs the Secretariat of Labor and Workforce Development to ascertain what jobs we're gonna need to capitalize on the economic opportunity that I mentioned uh, in, in areas other than solar, so particularly in offshore wind, and provide data uh, to the rest of state government about what those jobs are and what it's gonna to require to train people for those jobs so that we can uh, gear up for that. In addition to that, uh, the bill amends uh, the directive to the Clean Energy Center about developing markets and workforce to look at uh, businesses and communities that have been underrepresented so far in this form of economic development. And that's very important. Importantly, it also establishes the Clean Energy Investment Fund, which again is gonna be administered uh, by the Clean Energy Technology Center uh, to be able to advance research and technologies. I think many of us are aware that right now the CEC has been testing blades, uh, for instance, uh, in the area that's right under the Tobin Bridge um, in the Boston Seaport and doing great work there to, to advance the state of the art with the hope that we can be able to develop those blades here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and certainly in the United States as opposed to having to source them from abroad. Uh, we certainly in some cases have to do that, uh, but we'd like to domesticate much more of that industry in, in Massachusetts. And in addition to that, there's, there's a, a subtle directive here, but one that's very important to the CEC to be essentially the clearinghouse for offshore wind technology and to be the focal point for that industry. So as we're seeing Massachusetts climate policy evolve, what we're seeing is a larger and larger role for the CEC so that it can essentially be akin to one-stop shopping uh, for folks that are stakeholders and, and want to interact uh, with that industry. Um, in addition to that, when we look at growing the economic opportunity uh, in those areas, there's also a directive in this bill, the most recent one, uh, to expand eligibility for grants to look at small scale energy sources, including hydrogen from non-fossil fuel sources, networked and deep geothermal and fusion energy. And I know that last comment given the news over the last few days is gonna attract a lot of attention. And I think it's important to say that in Massachusetts, there has been probably over the last maybe 20 years, but certainly the last 10, a lot of emphasis on trying to look at what historically was called cold fusion and now is just more generally referred to as fusion, uh, basically the idea of combining nuclei and to have a release of energy rather than splitting atoms and creating energy in that way. And so uh, the, the eligibility for grant funding uh, has been expanded to include that form of energy. And there is in fact, at least one company in Massachusetts that's pursuing that idea very aggressively. Um, we, I think we've still got a long way to go in my humble opinion. Uh, but it's certainly a promising source for the future that uh, the CEC will now be able to give grant support to. Uh, there is an addition, uh, and this is another point of the bill, uh, sort of a doubling down on wind energy. And so the bill creates a Massachusetts offshore wind uh, industry investment program uh, to be able to give no more than $35 million a year uh, in offshore wind tax incentives. And that usually takes the form of a tax credit. It can go in other directions as well. But the idea is that we're really trying to ramp up our offshore wind procurement and trying to be able to attract uh, some of the best companies in the world to be able to come here and, uh, and prosecute that industry. Uh, and so uh, the, the offshore wind industry investment program uh, is gonna develop not only uh, the folks that are going to supply this energy and work on these projects, but also the workforce. And I've, I've already touched on that a little bit uh, to be able to do that. Uh, the CEC uh, is going to administer uh, the Offshore Wind Industry Investment Fund, again, keeping with the idea of one-stop shopping. Uh, 
Um, and uh, very importantly, and this is a discussion that's happening and it's happening in a very intense way in state government and elsewhere, is what is the role of natural gas? And so there is an element of this bill uh, that eliminates natural gas extensions from the CPACE program, which is a funding mechanism that uses some state assistance. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, so an, along those same lines, there's a component of the bill that prohibits uh, plans that are filed by uh, electric distribution companies uh, and municipal aggregators, our local municipal electric plants, uh, from spending on certain items for new fossil fuel equipment. And, and this is very important and very significant. So under the, this directive, the investor-owned utilities and our local municipal electric plants cannot spend money for certain things relative to fossil fuels unless they are being installed as a backup to renewable sources. And, and most often that combination works out being heat pumps and some sort of a, a natural gas uh, backup boiler or furnace uh, or things of that nature. So that's very important. And it signals a very important direction for where uh, the Commonwealth uh, is going. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I'm just trying to pick through these, um, anaerobic digestion. Uh, there's been some issue with that and using that to be able to generate uh, energy. And there are provisions in this bill that uh, incorporate some forms of anaerobic digestion into the renewable energy portfolio standard, the so-called RPS, but in a very, very restricted kind of a way uh, so far. Now, one of the things that we all know has been very difficult for us to uh, pursue has been the transportation sector with regard to reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And the driving forward bill does try to address that in a number of different ways. And one of them uh, creates uh, an electric vehicle adoption incentive trust fund. This is the fund that provides rebates uh, for the purchase of electric vehicles. But importantly, it also has been amended to add emphasis to charging stations because what we've been finding is folks might be able to afford the electric vehicle, but a lot of the advanced charging systems are very costly and, and beyond the reach of a lot of household budgets. Now, this is very important. So the, the rebates are going to be between $3,500 and $5,000 for passenger vehicles and light duty trucks, which cost less than $55,000. And this is a point of contention because many of these vehicles cost more than that and there's an ongoing debate about whether that $55,000 number should be moved even incrementally. And that's something that uh, we're gonna continue uh, to, to debate. In addition to that, uh, the program allows uh, up to a $4,500 additional rebate uh, for low-income households. And that's another important part of this discussion is that we wanna ensure that trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is not something that only folks who are wealthy can participate in. We wanna make sure that folks that are of lower income can participate as well. And that's a bit of an elusive goal, but uh, that additional $4,500 rebate uh, is intended to do that. Another section of the bill looks at something that is very important and that is agricultural land. And a lot of times agricultural land is subject to a lot of restrictions in terms of what it can be used for for tax purposes and other state support programs like APRs. And the bill expands the ability of agricultural land to be able to use, be used for renewable energy production. And so that is, is very important uh, and, and something that I think that we're gonna spend even more time on in the future. Uh, but in the drive forward bill, we're at least looking at expanding the use of agricultural land for renewable energy production. And I would point out that in many cases, uh, that benefits uh, not only the environment, but it also helps our family farms. So uh, we're beginning to look at that as well. Um, in addition uh, to that, and this was a, a piece of the bill that I worked on significantly, uh, we require uh, the Department of Transportation to produce a database of vehicles and where they're registered so that we understand where the electric vehicles currently are, where the fossil fuel powered vehicles are, so that we can plan the infrastructure that's gonna be needed 
uh, to charge and support of the electric uh, vehicles over time. Now, section 46 of the bill has been somewhat controversial and I, and I wanna call your attention to it. And it requires that by 2035 or as of 2035, the sale of a motor vehicle by a dealer, a new motor vehicle that is not a zero emission vehicle will be considered an unfair or deceptive trade practice under the consumer protection laws of Massachusetts. And so that's very, very significant that essentially after 2035, a new vehicle in Massachusetts, if this remains unchanged, uh, will not be able to be anything other than a zero emission vehicle. Um, beyond that, we all know the role that uh, TNC companies are playing in our lives like Uber and Lyft. Uh, the bill requires them uh, to submit biennial plans to annually or biannually, biannually um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions on their part as well. Again, you see a focus in this bill on trying to get at the transportation sector because it has been one of the more difficult places to be able to address. Um, and along those same lines, uh, we know that the MBTA uh, is a significant emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. And so the bill requires uh, the MBTA uh, capital plan to prioritize capital investments that reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And I've only got a little bit more to go. So I apologize, it's a lot of material. Um, but the- five, um, minute, five, minute, five minute warning. All right, Dick, I'll, I'll do my best. I think I can do it. All right. There's another part of the bill that requires the Department of Public Utilities to remove impediments to the development of efficient utility scale, non-emitting renewable thermal energy. And this is another dimension of, of climate policy in Massachusetts uh, that has been advancing very rapidly uh, over the last uh, couple of sessions. And so this talks about re uh, re improving or removing impediments to thermal energy, geothermal. And I'll, I'll talk more about that um, in a little bit. Uh, but in addition to that, there are sections in the bill uh, relative to uh, infrastructure replacement. And this specifically relates to our utility companies and replacing gas infrastructure. And so uh, obviously we need them to continue to repair uh, aging and leaking natural gas infrastructure to ensure that it's safe. But there's also provisions here uh, to allow the utility companies to look at maybe replacing some of that infrastructure with pipelines and ducting that can transmit geothermal energy at utility scale. And then this is something that uh, particularly came up after we had a lot of the natural gas explosions in Lawrence and North Andover and Andover, where we looked at the transmission system and the, and the density of the housing to see if we might be able to, to replace transmitting natural gas through the infrastructure with transmitting geothermal energy. Still, we've got a ways to go, but it's important to think about, uh, and, and that's, that's important. Now, the next section, again, is something that I worked on a lot, and I think we fell short on this one, but I think it's important that we addressed it. And that is the idea of grid modernization and reliability. We are, with all of the um, requirements and all of the movements that we have uh, toward electrifying space conditioning and transportation, we are increasing substantially electric load. And we must have must have the ability to transmit electricity and distribute electricity to meet that load. And we, we have to do that in the context of an aging transmission infrastructure that we have now. So section 60 of the bill uh, requires electric companies to develop electric sector modernization plans to proactively upgrade distribution and transmission systems. And another part of this section is something that I worked on over the last few years that again is, is very, very important. And I'm reading the question in the chat. Uh, we don't have a provision relative to uh, the percentage of electric lines that are required to be buried. But, I, but what we do do is require the electric companies to forecast electric demand. This is gonna be a very important part of what we do going forward. And so they have to have a five-year forecast 
a 10-year forecast, and a demand assessment through 2050 to account for future trends. And they have to use three planning horizons for that. So you've got the, the five-year, the 10-year, and the 2050. And this was a part of the bill that I worked on and, and amended because I feel very, very strongly about this, that we need to have a, a absolute understanding of demand that we're gonna have to meet. And then we're gonna have to have plans to be able to meet that demand. Um, in addition, the next section goes back to offshore energy, offshore wind energy, and it removes the decision making from the utility companies themselves and places it with the Department of Energy Resources so that there's a more objective judgment of the procurements and the contracts. That's a significant change. Um, and in addition, it directs the DOR to consider certain things, not only the cost of the electricity, but the reliability of the electricity, and also uh, utilizing transmission that might be procured in a separate bid. And, and that's another piece that I, I wanna speak to. Uh, one of the pieces that I worked on adding to this bill was allowing transmission to be bid separately from generation, so that we might find ourselves in a position that somebody wants to create one set of transmission cables from all the offshore projects so that we can efficiently move that energy without having three or four or five sets of cables coming from three or four or five different locations for the, the generation of energy. We don't know that that will get us a better price, but we are through this bill and through the amendments that we added, we're able to now think about that and, and entertain bids uh, for that. Um, there are very importantly to us in coastal communities, provisions in the bill that requires, uh, the, uh, requires environmental protections for uh, in, uh, offshore wind projects relative to protection of right whales, coastal and marine habitats, natural resources and ecosystems. Very, very important that as we develop offshore wind, we minimize its impacts. Now, there's certainly gonna be impacts, but we wanna make sure that people minimize them to the greatest extent, and those things will be carefully considered uh, in bidders, uh, so uh, in what they submit for bids. Um, the MBTA will be required under this bill uh, to purchase uh, exclusively zero emission passenger buses by December 31st, of 2040. Um, again, uh, bidding is, is allowed uh, just for transmission as opposed to generation. Um, and another section of the bill, section 72, it is again something very important to me. We require at least one rate filing by our electric utility companies to include a plan for storage. Storage is gonna be critically important and I'll talk more about that later but we require there be a plan for that. Um, and Dick, we're almost at the end. So we're almost there. Um, and let's see, we require the Mass DOT to help our RTAs make the transition to electric buses. And I know that's something that the coalition has been talking about that. One of the things that came straight from Cape Ann is a commission, a commercial fisheries commission that is broadly representative of all the sectors of the fishing industry to make recommendations about how offshore wind energy production can coexist with our marine fisheries. And the language for that was a product of a lot of work uh, by uh, the Fishermen's Wives Association um, and by the Northeast Seafood Coalition. I'm very proud that we got a unanimous vote to include that into this bill. Um, so Storage, again, we direct DOER to look at long-term storage. It's gonna be important. I'll talk more about it later. Um, and there's also an interagency coordinating council that's gonna look statewide at where we put charging stations so that we don't have deserts in Massachusetts where there aren't charging stations and have too many charging stations in another place where not as many are needed. Um, the school building authority, something that we've touched on a little bit, uh, in our conversations with the coalition um, is directed to look at um, an energy assessment for all of our school buildings and to make recommendations on how to shift away from fossil fuels. Um, another very controversial part of this bill is the uh, requirement that the Department of Energy Resources establish a demonstration project 
in which 10 municipalities can adopt ordinances or bylaws prohibiting new construction that uses fossil fuels in terms of space conditioning. And that was a, a very controversial part of this bill. Um, one other amendment that I added was a directive for the CEC, the Clean Energy Center, to maintain a publicly searchable database about what electric vehicles are out there and available. Oftentimes we hear that uh, electric powered vehicles cost so much, most of us can't afford them. Well, there are more and more offerings becoming available every single day, and we want people to know what they are. Um, biomass, um, there's been a lot of discussion about eliminating biomass plants uh, from the renewable portfolio standard. And in fact, in this bill, they are now eliminated from eligibility for state support in that way. I think we and, better uh, wrap it up, Bruce. Yep. All right, Dick. So it's a lot to thing, Mass DOT will develop some incentives for RTAs to be able to adopt electric vehicles. I'm going to breathe. I hope I got through that uh, in a fairly <laughs> reasonable way. You know, you, you made a lot of complex things seem reasonably understandable. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're um, welcome. And I think this gives a lot of people an incentive to read up and study more about the details of many of these important provisions. And so, by the way, Dick, if, if somebody wants any of this in writing, we're happy to provide it. Okay, you mean answers to questions or just? Answers to questions, but also the, the documents themselves. The documents, sure, okay. And, and I have pretty good section by section summaries for all of them, which, which make them much more digestible yep. than reading the original legislative language. Well, why, don't, uh, why don't we get those and we can put them in our newsletters? That'd okay, be we'd be happy to do that. <laughs> So um, <clears throat> Valerie Nelson is going to ask the first question. So thank you for that, Bruce. I did write down the entire list as you were speaking, and it, it sounds like a very complicated and impressive bill. I'd like to ask you to pivot over to the budgets, um, both state and federal uh, money coming down, um, because there's so much money in the, in the budgets now. And I guess... Uh, Governor Baker succeeded in getting federal allocations of money before he's out of office. So um, that money can be almost as significant as some of the policy and the legislation. So could you describe um, what that money is going for, what the legislature agreed to, where federal money is coming in, and how that's going to affect the ability of individuals and communities to, uh, and utilities to actually transition towards some of these goals. What happened this year with the flood of money, state and federal? So Val, this again is a complicated question, but I'm gonna give you the best succinct explanation I can. It will be shorter than the last one. So right. let's start with- You've only got five minutes, five minutes. <laughs> Let, let's start with the most significant funding that came through uh, in FY22, $50,000 uh, for the, uh, the Cape Ann Climate Coalition uh, yeah. to be able to have these discussions. And in 2023, $200,000 for the Cape Ann Climate Coalition. And, and that's directly as a result of the partnership that Ann Margaret and I have with all of you. And, and, and we really appreciate that and appreciate the work uh, that you're doing. Um, you. In the economic development bill that we most recently passed that you know was delayed for a long time and, and we actually adopted it very late in the legislative session. There's about $540 million for clean energy and climate resiliency initiatives. I'm gonna run through them really quickly. $250 million to accelerate and support clean energy initiatives. And a hundred million of that is to promote the adoption of more electric vehicles. Um, and I talked about some of the programs in, in my last explanation that that will support. A hundred million dollars for ports and port infrastructure to support offshore wind. $50 million for the Mass Clean Energy Center to accelerate the transition to an expansion of renewable energy. And Val, I would call your attention to that because I know you're always looking for places to go to look. The Clean Energy Center is going to have a lot of money going forward. And, and you know, we're going to need to work with them to be able to get that money flowing to Cape Ann. And, we're, and Ann Margaret and I are happy to do that. Um, $175 million for the conservation and improvement of publicly owned lands and green spaces. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, in fiscal year 2023, uh, the budget includes $375.2 million 
uh, for environmental services, again, for the protection of open spaces. In fiscal year 2022, uh, the budget included $13 million uh, for a trust fund to grow technical training programs for offshore wind um, in public higher education and vocational technical institutions. An opportunity there for Gloucester High School and the Gloucester Public Schools. Um, and then in December of 2021, with the money that the federal government gave us, the so-called ARPA money, uh, we put $100 million into environmental infrastructure grants, including municipal vulnerability preparedness, and $6.5 million for clean energy retrofitting in affordable housing units, and $5 million for the advancement of geothermal technologies. Now, I will say this, a lot of the funding that is gonna come from the federal legislation is not gonna pass directly through state government. And this is something that we all have to work on because a lot of it is gonna be a, a, in an, on a nationwide competitive basis. And it's gonna flow directly from the federal government to the grant applicant. And we're gonna to need to do some work on that. And we're actually working with Congressman Moulton's office on maybe putting together a presentation on how that's gonna work. So one Let's, major thing is that uh, clean water funding uh, could be of great use to Gloucester when it goes for its secondary waste, wastewater treatment plan. And was that part of this federal bill as well? Yes, yes. it was. There is, um, and I'm trying to uh, find it, but we put uh, $100 million for water and sewer infrastructure investments through the Clean Water Trust. So as you know, the way that the state supports water and sewer projects in municipalities is through two uh, trust funds, two state revolving funds that give out zero interest or 2% interest loans to the municipalities, which when you consider that discount is usually a, a pretty sizable grant equivalent. We put $100 million um, in, the, in the ARPA bill and then more money than that, another I believe it was $150 million in the economic development bill into those trust funds to be able to buy down the debt and eliminate it so that the municipalities don't even have to borrow against it, we'll just extinguish it. So, and I, I predict you may see more of that to come. So that's probably the biggest item, budget item for Gloucester at least is, is helping with the wastewater treatment plan. Yeah. It, it absolutely is. And, and I think Gloucester will be the beneficiary, beneficiary of those contributions to the, to the trust fund, particularly the, the water pollution abatement trust fund, which is the account that funds sewer improvements. Uh, there is no doubt that that fund is going to play a major role in Gloucester's treatment plan. And the hope is that the additional dollars will help what Gloucester has to borrow be for less. Okay. So um, one question that um, I was thinking, and you, you've sort of alluded to this, but what would your, what are the, what are the major impacts from th this bill on Cape Ann? And what can we as a coalition help to explain and act in our catalytic, catalytic role to people to build support for and build understanding of? What, what are the top three, say? I mean, I, I think the, I'll, I say right away, I agree with you on the grid, but that's a little, that's a huge lift. And, and I mean, I know some like Bomco, for example, is extremely worried about the electrical reliability because they have changed from gas to electric for all their furnaces. And it's a big business threat to them that they, the grid won't be able to handle their future. You're absolutely right, Dick. And, and, and I would say that modernizing the grid is a, is a big sort of a large scale thing. Right. But what we can think about a little bit on Cape Ann is whether or not we want to have some micro grids that might be able to benefit from a renewable energy that's generated and be able to kept locally either behind the meter or in front of the meter. Uh, but, but my top three would be number one, uh, helping to get more of these dollars here for increased charging stations for electric vehicles. Number two, working with the regional transit authority uh, to be able to uh, increase uh, renewable energy powered vehicles. They've already started to look at that and Kate has been a good partner. And number three, uh, really thinking about uh, how we can uh, produce some energy storage on Cape Ann, and that ties in with the microgrids. One of the, the difficulties that we're going to have is that renewables, as you know, wind and, and solar energy are intermittent, and they don't produce energy 100% of the time, but baseload demand is 100% of the time. And we need to think about 
how to develop on a distributed basis all across Massachusetts storage so that we can supply the energy demand that we have with energy that was produced from renewables and stored rather than have to activate a peaking power plant or trigger the use of fossil fuels to generate electricity. And we could have a, an entire session on that. Um, yeah, we, one I, of think we, I think we, we might wanna do that. I mean, Town Green is gonna be considering its 2023 priorities in um, January, but I, I think microgrids and storage for particularly first responder institutions and the hospital is right up there to get a feasibility grant to figure that out. One of the things the Harvard study pointed out was that we have enough solar uh, capability that's not tapped yet in municipal and private commercial and private residential areas to give all of our electricity by double, double what we need right now. So we don't have to you know, use all of it, but we certainly have the capacity to tie that into microgrids with batteries and be independent distributed sources. There's no question that local generation is going to continue to be important. Sorry. No, I have a, I'd like to go back to, you mentioned the Fisheries Commission on the offshore wind. Obviously, um, we get questions around this as a fishing port. And we, one of the questions in the chat today is, is any of that port funding or any energy funding for more fuel efficient boats or investment? Can we get investments in our port? And how do you view the fishing industry playing a role in the offshore wind? What are your thoughts about what their concerns are or um, why you put that commission in? Well, the, the fishing industry is gonna play a pivotal role in the development of offshore wind because uh, we do not want to extinguish their, their survival uh, to be able to get a resource that we need. They also produce a resource that we need in terms of a protein resource. And there's a lot of concern in the fishing industry uh, about where some of these projects are gonna be located. Uh, we know where the federal lease parcels are um, down to the, in, off of southeastern Massachusetts and even further south than that. But the newest concern, Val, and I know you know this, but for the edification of people who are listening, is the Gulf of Maine, uh, which has historically been a very rich fishing ground for codfish and other species. And the proposals now are going to be for floating wind energy uh, production, offshore wind, uh, in the Gulf of Maine. And the density of those projects could be a significant problem uh, because we know that fish migrate and they're mobile and they're not always in one place on the same day. So you can't say that, okay, this area, there's no fish today. So we're gonna put all the floating offshore wind platforms. You can't do that. So we, we got to think through that. And, and that's a, a huge thing. That's why we created that commission. Now, I know I also saw in the chat, uh, there was a question about improving uh, the, um, the fuel efficiency uh, of the vessels. And Representative Ferrante has worked a lot on that and has worked on funding, and we can talk more about that later, um, to be able to make vessels more fuel efficient. And I put into a bond bill a couple of years ago uh, an earmark to look at replacing vessels with more fuel efficient vessels. The difficulty is, is always going to be that, as we know, that the revenue of the fishing industry is constrained right now for a variety of reasons that I won't get into here. So you're asking folks that don't have the capacity to fund these improvements to carry the burden of reducing greenhouse gas emission. So we're working on that on, on two fronts, some bond money and also some operational dollars. And I'll get you some more information that hopefully can be shared uh, about some of our initiatives on that. Front. And federal money, do you see the port federal money as a source? Potentially. Great. And then on the environmental arena, we do appreciate that 200,000 to start looking at our ecosystems, coastal forested uplands and green infrastructure downtown and whatever. How much of the federal and state money will go for coastal restoration, nature-based solutions over time? Uh, is a significant amount going for that? Yes, well, the, the, the MVP program right now that funds cities and towns um, is very substantial. Um, and so uh, we will be continuing to put more money into that. And, and Gloucester has benefited from that already. And, and the, I believe uh, some of the other Cape Ann communities have as well. I can't tell you off the top of my head, but right now that's the principal vehicle for doing that. But in addition to that, 
There's a lot of work being done, and you and I have talked about this in the Great Marsh, uh, because the, the Great Marsh is one of the best resources we have uh, to absorb carbon that's already in the atmosphere, and also to help us deal with sea level rise and attenuate energy from uh, storms, hurricanes and, and ocean-based storms. So we have been leading the way, and I would argue that on the North Shore, we have been leading the country in terms of developing those natural resources as a means to combat the threat of climate change and sea level rise. And over the course of the last several years, we've been putting between $100,000 and $200,000 um, into uh, marsh revitalization efforts. But the good news is those dollars have leveraged millions of federal dollars uh, in terms of doing things like eliminating Phragmites so that the marsh can continue to thrive and grow. And we're doing things like looking at thin layer deposition, which is where you put dredge spoils in thin layers on the marsh and allow the vegetation to grow through it and continue to elevate the marsh to keep pace with sea level rise. So there's going to be a lot of resources available for that. And right now, in the area from Cape Ann to the New Hampshire border, we're really at the epicenter of a lot of the leadership in this country on those issues. That's great to hear. So Cape Ann can make strides in, in adopting some of those things and with state help. Absolutely. Great. Um, I think that our purpose in doing this is just to uh, explain the bill and the kind of language you're, you're good at to simplify it for our audience, but also to, to deepen our relationship with you because you've been very helpful to the coalition and to Town Green and to help us um, you know, get the resources we need and to serve as a uh, information conduit to us, to the decision makers. We really, we hope that can continue. Uh, and we are looking for you to participate in you know, our overall mission is to bring the four communities of Cape Ann to understand and work with each other in a deeper way and ultimately to collaborate as independent as they are. <clears throat> uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunity. And if you could just speak a little bit about that in, in your closing, maybe take a couple minutes here to close, but the potential for Cape Ann to unite more, to collaborate more, to address these huge issues. So thanks, Dick. Let me first uh, say right back at you. Um, the coalition is incredibly important and what you communicate to us is very helpful. Our discussions are very helpful. And I think as you could pick up from some of what I've said this afternoon, uh, the, all of you have inspired some of the most important things that we have done legislatively. And I always like to say that Beacon Hill doesn't have a monopoly on wisdom. You know, some of the best ideas that make their way into legislation come from people in our communities that are interested in these issues. And this coalition is a very powerful example of that. So you can count on me to continue the discussion. And I think sometimes Dick, it's helpful when we have a little bit narrower discussions focused on some things, sort of focus groups. And, and that could yeah. be an important thing as we move forward. But I feel that KPN is incredibly important as a geographic unit to be able to work together and to be able to do things that will be pioneering relative to public transportation, relative to microgrids, relative to distributed generation on our rooftops and in our open spaces, and, and we need to preserve those open spaces, relative to carbon sequestration. These are all things where we are uniquely poised to be able to, and situated, to be able to take action and develop measurable results because of the, the compact nature of our geography. Uh, we can measure things better than maybe other places can. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, diversity in terms of neighborhoods that where there's more open space, neighborhoods where there's more density of housing. We have a lot of ability to be able to pilot things and pioneer things by working together. But it's also, in my opinion, a little bit unfair and, and unreasonable to ask any one community to take on all of that. And, and so when you, you pull people together, I, I think everyone is pretty familiar with my belief in regional approaches to things, whether it be uh, coastal erosion or drought or, or, or whatever. And I think in this case, uh, we are really situated. And I'll tell you this, the fact that 45 people right now are talking about this issue at, you know, at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, 
speaks a lot about uh, the enthusiasm and the resourcefulness of, of people on Cape Ann to do this. Well, thank you very much. And I think we'll, we'll wrap it up now. We look forward to getting that um, annotated um, uh, exp explanation of the bill, because I think that would be helpful. How do you guys think about it in your office? And we can share that. And uh, we look forward to further discussions. And I want to thank everybody for participating and being with us. And um, you can email your questions further. We'll, we'll take note of the chat questions we didn't get to. And we'll be summarizing this in our newsletters. And there'll be a recording posted on the Cape Ann Coalition website for you to look at. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, thank you very Thank much. you all very much. And happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>